Sancho, you've always been an extremely visual scientist. When did that start? Have you, because you, you were, you knew Escher and your father knew Escher. Did it come from that or was it something? Oh, no. Well, <coughs> my father was very artistic. He came from, well, his brother was Roland Penrose, who was well known uh, in surrealist. I mean, he, he was in, in with the surrealist group and uh, was one of the founders of the Institute for Contem Contemporary Arts. And uh, he and th those two and their brothers were all very artistic. And their, their father was a professional portrait painter, huh. um, James Doyle Penrose. He used to um, do very sort of realistic sort of pictures, very religious pictures too. Right. And then your father became friends with, with Escher, didn't he? Well, this, the, the story is more complicated than that. It always is with Roger. <laughs> See, when I was a graduate student in Cambridge, I went to the International Congress of Mathematicians, which was being held in Amsterdam. That was in my second year as a graduate student. And I heard about this ex exhibition by this extraordinary artist. They'd had an exhibition there because all the mathematicians around, they thought they would be interested in Escher. And it was one of the lecturers who I saw the, cat the his had a catalog and he opened up with a picture of the birds flying both ways at once, night and day. But there were a lot of fantastic pictures there. And uh, I came away thinking that I'd like to do something impossible myself. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I finally, I tried to draw pictures with bridges and railways and roads and things going in impossible ways. And I simplified this to, to a triangle. So that it's a, a triangle where it, or it, each two edges meet at right angles and it's impossible that you can see the picture of it. But I didn't know that you invented that. I did, apart from it having been invented several years earlier by somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> but Excellent. it wasn't quite the same. There's a man called Oscar Ro Rotisvard who was a a Swedish artist. He had a thing with cubes going around, which basically the same idea. You can trace back the idea to um, old pictures, Bruegel's, I forget what they are. Yeah, th th there are. Um, and were you interested to, I mean, you, as I said, you, you've always been interested in infinity, or at least it crops up everywhere in your work. Um, and of course, Escher's paintings, they often, they often start off with a, f a few simple shapes at, at the center, and then a little bit further out, it's the same shape, but smaller, and there's more of them. And then, obviously, as you get to the edge, if you could oh, yeah. magnify it, there'd yeah. be an infinite number of them. Oh, yes. Now that, that, that was stimulated by somebody else. That was a, the Coxeter, who, who was another mathematician, hmm. um, who was, well, I call him a Canadian. I think he was uh, <coughs> Scottish originally. But anyway, he... Uh, acquainted Escher with these pictures, circle, what they call, what Escher called circle limits, where you have angels and devils and they all get more and more crowded up to the edge. And uh, the edge represents the infinity of the world that they inhabit. So these are... But is that, that how important is the picture to your work? Because for someone like me who looks at it, it seems well, well, very, very important. <laughs> right. why, why do you find pictures so useful? Because lots of your contemporaries, Don't. they're, they're, they're <laughs> pure mathematics. And although you are a mathematician, it's unusual that you combine math, but with pictures, you, that's how you, every time I've been to see you and I can't understand, which is most of the time, he says, ah, and starts to draw a picture. At which point I still don't understand, but at least there's a picture. Well, you see, wh when I, I went to university college as an undergraduate, and I was expecting when I went there, I would find people who think like me, you see, because um, I, could, I was perhaps more mathematical than, oh, there were a few other quite good mathematical people at, at school. But I thought, you know, okay, they'll all be like me, you see. Well, I didn't expect to find so many different ways of thinking about mathematics. And one of the biggest divisions is whether you like to think visually or in terms of equations. And there were only about two of us in the whole class who preferred to think visually. So it's not, it's not so common in mathematics. Uh, the best mathematicians can do both, you know, they can, they can, well, I wouldn't say the best, a lot of the best can think that way. But it's kind of unusual. Well, you see, when it came to the exams, uh, my best papers were not the geometry papers. My best paper was in algebra, curiously enough, because, you see, when you do a geometry problem, you have to see how to do it, and it, it's geometrical. And then you've got to translate that into words. 
and you write down the words. And you have to keep flipping back from one way of thinking to another way of thinking. So my view is that it doesn't really help in, in examinations. To be a visual thinker it doesn't help you so much in exams. And so maybe that's a reason that mathematicians on the whole aren't as geometrical as you might think. I mean, certainly it's a minority of them who think that way. Right. Uh, w one of the, the other areas that you worked in, is a, is a small story, that, that there was a, a competition some while ago, I can't remember how long ago, that amongst mathemat mathematicians. They decided, well, what's the minimum number of shapes that, it will that are, you can tile an infinite floor with? This is how they amuse themselves, I think. And, uh, and at one point, and I, I, will, I know I'll get the details wrong, but I think it was a, a, a Chinese chap had it down to several thousand shapes. With it was several a, stu a student of his, yes. Right, several thousand yeah, yeah. shapes. He could prove that you could tile an infinite space with these, this set number of tiles, and the pattern would never repeat. So it's not like a square tile. And then Roger got involved because he thought, ooh, that sounds interesting. Would anyone like to guess how many shapes Roger has got it down to? Just shout out. Say no, <laughs> yes, and everyone else went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, it, got, it walked its way down. I think it got down to about 100 by Robert Berger, who had the number right. originally. And then it got down to, kept working its way down to, until it got down to six. Right. And I was aware of that six. I had another way of doing it with six, you see. But when I heard about that, and I was told that the chap who did this liked to find the smallest number. So I said, well, I can do it with five. <laughs> because I could glue two of my bits together. Well, it wasn't quite like that. But, but then I fiddled around and I got it down to two. <laughs> <coughs> and that was the end of that competition. <laughs> <laughs> but the interesting thing about it is, you think, well, that's an interesting pastime. But actually, this work on, on aperiodic tiling has tremendous things to say about the limits of logic and the way that consciousness might work. And, and it's one of the things that's most interesting about your work is that <coughs> Roger goes off in all these different directions, but uh, are, you are you thinking, ah, oh, this will give me another avenue back to this? Because they, your work has been tremendously varied, but, but it does sort of double back to things that you've always been preoccupied, like the limits of logic. I don't know whether I can answer that question. I don't know. I just do what interests me mainly. And the logic thing, I had a lot of conversations when I was an undergraduate with Ian Percival. He used to talk about, well, a lot of other things, but logic was certainly one of the things he talked about. And I was very worried by this thing called Gödel's theorem <laughs> because it seemed to show that there were things in mathematics you couldn't prove. And then when I went to Cambridge as a graduate student, and I went to three lecture courses which were nothing to do with my actual work. <laughs> One was by Herman Bondi on, on general relativity and cosmology. One was by Paul Dirac, famous quantum mechanics, one of the founders of quantum mechanics. And uh, he, he gave, um, they were both beautiful sort of sets of lectures in a completely different way. And then I went to another course, which was a course by a man called Steen on mathematical logic, because I was interested in this Gödel question. And I learned about Turing machines, those are the general, well, the basis of modern computers, if you like, Turing machines, and uh, I learned about Gödel's theorem. And I learned, to my relief, that it was not that Gödel showed that there are things you couldn't prove. It's just that if you had a particular set of rules that you follow, and that these rules are things you could put on a computer to check whether they've done, been done right, then those rules, you can find some other example. But these rules prove things about numbers, you see, and infinite things. There you are, you <laughs> see, <laughs> infinite things about numbers, um, such as, for example, um, every number is the sum of four square numbers, which is proved by Lagrange. It's quite a hard theorem. Or that every even number greater than two is the sum of two prime numbers. That's still unproved. Things of that sort, you see. These are s statements about the infinite. Now the question is, you've got certain rules about how you prove things. And if you fix those rules, and if you believe they only give you truths, what Gödel does, he comes along and says, well, look, here's a statement of just the same kind, but you could see 
by virtue of understanding what the statement means, that you cannot prove it using those rules if you trust those rules to only give you truths. So if you're using the rules only give you true things, here's another thing which you can see is true by virtue of your knowledge that the rules only give you true things, but you cannot prove it using the rules. I mean, so it's a twist of logic, really. So you can, you, you can tell it's true by knew, knowing that the rules only give you truths, but you can't use it, prove it using the rules. Yes. And that I found that stunning. You see, it's yes. just, just absolutely stunning. I mean, th in, in case that's puzzling, that, that's <laughs> the, mathem the deep mathematical version of this statement is false. Yes, but if that's... Uh, <laughs> you, you all understood it because you understand the rules yes. of, of the English language, but you can't decide whether what I said is true or not. Yes, it has to be... And not it's not because I didn't say it <laughs> properly or that you didn't understand it properly, and that's a trivial version, uh, and, and Gödel... Yes, but what Gödel really says, this statement is not provable by those rules. Yes. And but that's, but, that's but proved it, it. And, yeah. and is it? Would you agree that it basically made him the most unpopular logician ever? Well, I hope not. <laughs> well, uh, well, I say that if you uh, he, he taught at the not. University of Vienna, and if you go to the courtyard, the university there, big, huge building, and they have a very proudly a bust in in marble. Every single famous professor or every professor who who taught there, going back several centuries, except for Kurt Gödel. Well, that's a big mistake. <laughs> Yes. Oh, gosh. So, I don't so think yeah. I made him, no. No, he opened up all sorts of things. He opened up huge areas of mathematics. No. Yes, but he does pull the rug out from under the pretension <laughs> yes, that you will true. have a formal yes. system yes. which, once you've got it, will be able to give you the correct answer to any question you give it, which is... The, the, the still the founding belief that we'll be able to create an AI and when we do it'll give us the answer to everything. Yeah, Gödel rather clearly said, no, it won't. <laughs> well, I, I mean, yeah, that's where it leads you. I mean, it shows you, that's the way it led me, you see. Yes, it but that's made you quite unpopular too. I have no idea. Well, <laughs> people disagree with me, that's yes, true. Yes, they do. <laughs> I don't know. Well, they quite, a few, quite a few bought my book, The Empress of Mind. <laughs> so it can't be just unpopularity that did Well, no, but I just spent, <laughs> I spent several months interviewing lots and lots of the, the techie boys who are um, doing the AI revolution. Oh, I and if I mention oh, your yeah. name, they go, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, that's, you see, it does show that there is something different going on in, I mean, this is what I learned from Steen's course. It may not have been quite how he put it, but, but there is something going on in human understanding which is not computational. That it's different from what a computer does. So, okay, when people call it artificial intelligence, I think that's a misnomer. What artificial should it be? cleverness, perhaps. Right. But AC stands for uh, you know, alternating current, so we couldn't say <laughs> it. That wouldn't work, you see. <laughs> right, but how many people would you say, mm, I know you don't like sides in this, but. <laughs> I may agree with but you. The, but the, the, the fashion has run against you. The fashion is that, no, no, we're going to build a machine, and, and human consciousness is essentially, we will be able to capture it in a digital machine. Yeah, well, I think that's just wrong. No. There you heard it here first. No, no I mean, you can make it... Well, you said I did something else more recently. I p produced a chess position, you see, which <coughs> you give it to Fritz, tuned, so that's the best chess computer system, you see, and you program it to, to be at grandmaster level. And this is a chess position that you show it to any human player who, who knows anything about the game at all. It's obviously a drawn game. It's a draw. But if you give it to Fritz and play against Fritz, it loses. Really? Yeah. And I was expecting it to lose, too. You're a clever clogs, aren't you? Well... <laughs> Well, not at chess, that's, that's my... <laughs> I was the chess dancer in my family. And how do people react to this? That must have upset the Google people know. immensely. Well, some people say, oh, I could, I could program my computer to do that. But of course, that's cheating, because you're using yeah. your understanding yes. to... Well, I'm not sure. Wouldn't it be quite hard to, to... I mean, you can do it to... I could program... Even I could com program a computer to do the right thing in this position. But then you see changes a little bit, then I wouldn't, you see. Yes. This position, you see, that, that's all I mean. You could, he could program it to get the right answer for that position, sure. But then, y y y when you say,
is there something going on in, in human consciousness which is non-computational? It's quite an innocent sounding sentence, really. But what, would you, what word would you reach for to describe the thing which is not computational? Would you reach for something like intuition or inspiration? Understanding. Understanding. Yeah. But an understanding that you didn't get through by steps of logic. Yeah, but you see, even that's not understanding. You're just following the rules. You see, if you simply follow the rules you've been given, you can do that without any understanding. The understanding yes. is why the rules work. Right. And that's something different. Right. And that's why I say the girdle thing shows you that if you know why these steps will give you only truths, if you've gone through that, that level of understanding allows you to transcend those rules themselves. Yes, and that's something that, that, that Gödel and you and someone like Greg Chaitin have all said. The computer, once you've given it the rules, right, the rules that they put into DeepMind or the, you know, the, the, the program that beat Gary Kasparov, it can laboriously explore all permutations of that rules, but it can't jump outside the rules. And you're saying the saying human yeah. mind <coughs> can, but not by having another rule that steps behind it to say, of oh, now and again, jump out of these rules, because you'd then be trapped in that larger set of rules. You'd still be trapped. And the interesting thing about, uh, about Gödel is he spent the last 20 years of his life trying to prove intuition and slowly starved himself to death. He went bonkers. But, um, <laughs> but there's a rather interesting thing, isn't it, to, to, to want to prove that, you can, that intuition lies outside of proof. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's, you can get a long way with not uh, understanding. I mean, that's what I have. Yeah, I've got do. a long way without understanding <laughs> anything. <laughs> yes. But, um, yeah. No, but you asked me what do I think it is, you yeah. see. That, that leads into another route, you see. I mean, this was the sort of reasoning that I was using. I mean, you know, I, I'm being, although I was brought up in this Quaker family, as we were discussing earlier, um, I didn't have any religious beliefs. And so, that even though I think there's something going on in our heads which transcends understanding and therefore is not a computer in the ordinary sense of the word, what could it be? Because we know that the laws of physics, I think we've had a wonderful example of that recently with these gravitational waves coming from black holes spiraling into each other, which this LIGO detector, <coughs> they um, it can tell because of enormous calculations that people have done on Einstein's theory, they know exactly what form these waves should be, and so they, therefore you can tell when the, de the detector has actually received waves of that type. So this is an example which shows you how, how powerful you can imitate nature, how powerful you can imitate nature in this subject of Einstein's general relativity. Now you see, I ask myself, okay, what else? Well, there's quantum mechanics. You see, now quantum mechanics, it consists of two parts, you see. This is basically, I learned from Dirac about the puzzles of quantum mechanics. <laughs> I think it was partly because I dozed off at the beginning. It wasn't it clear, my mind wandered at a certain point. This is his very first lecture. <laughs> you and dozed he, off in Dirac's lecture? No, I didn't doze <laughs> off. I, I, my mind wandered. <laughs> no. no, you see, it was right at the beginning, and he was talking about the, the superposition principle. But you see, if you have a particle, and if this one state of the particle is it's here, and another state of the particle is it's here, then you can have states where it's here and here at the same time. Yes. So you can see particles can be in two places at once. Crazy, but that's how quantum mechanics works. Then he took a piece of chalk, and I think he broke it in two, and said, look, the chalk is now, imagine it's here and here at the same time. That was the point my mind wandered, you see. Because he gave some explanation, I sort of, had the faintest idea what it was. I just remembered something about the word energy coming into it. And I've worried about that ever since, you see. So why is it that you don't have pieces of chalk in two places at once? Or people in two places at once and all that. And this is a big problem in quantum mechanics. So my view was that quantum mechanics can't be quite right. And Einstein had that view. Yes, he had a similar view, yes, yes. This is a little bit more specific because it has to do with why is it not right, but that took me longer to think about that. <laughs> but the view is that it can't be quite right. And the way in which it's not quite right has to be taken advantage of by the brain. So this was the idea that I had, and I wrote this book, The Emperor's New Mind, 
I thought probably it would disappear without trace. But then Stephen Hawking had, had written his book on the brief history of time. And uh, he had got, uh, what's his name, Carl Sagan to write a, a right. foreword. So I thought I should get somebody decent to write a foreword, then maybe. So I got Martin Gardner. So I, <coughs> I had no idea what Martin, Martin Gardner's views were. And he said, yes, I agree with you, he said. So, so he was happy to write a uh, foreword. And then I thought, well, it probably won't disappear without trace. No, the difference between the two books is that the brief history of time the Hawking's about that big, <laughs> and Roger's handy dandy quick primer for consciousness is about that big. It's got pictures. That big. <laughs> 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 yes. But it, it's interesting. It is true, a lot of people hated it, yes. They did. Oh, gosh, yeah. Because mm. I was making a series on consciousness at the time. And again, <laughs> my whole life has been mentioning you and people going like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because they, 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 the, the criticism was that all Roger has done is taken a mystery and wrapped it in an enigma and said, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Taken two things we didn't understand and say, because we don't understand these two things, um, they must be the same thing. That's not the argument at all. <laughs> 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 no. They hadn't read the book. No, a lot of them hadn't. That's true. No, that's true. But the thing is, you see, I, I had no idea what the answer was. So I wrote the book thinking that by the time I had to learn some neurophysiology and that sort of thing, by the time I'd learned that bit, I would see where there could be something going on in the brain. See, the argument had to be that it had to be some effect where gravity comes in. And, and, uh, and I had no idea at that time. It didn't seem to be that nerve prop propagation had any chance of uh, being the answer. And uh, the thing is, you see, I was hoping that this book would be...